morning. I'd like to thank Deborah Hart and Lung for asking me to speak today on cardiovascular MRI and adult congenital heart disease. My name is Mohit Basin, and I'm the president of Innovation Health Service. I'm also the medical director of cardiovascular MR and CT imaging at Centera Heart Hospital in Norfolk, Virginia, and the co-director of pediatric cardiovascular MRI and CT at Children's Hospital of the King's Daughters here in Norfolk, Virginia as well. I'm an ACHD cardiologist and I run a clinic for aortic diseases and I also read lots of imaging in cardiac MRI, cardiac CT, PET, and nuclear techniques as well as transesophageal echo and uh, transthoracic echo and, and so in my day teaching fellows and radiology residents how to interpret lots of thoracic exams. I focus their attention on the improvement of the patient's outcomes. We have to pick the right test for the right patient and that means um, many times using multiple tests to get to the answers we want and also it means acquiring their images technically accurately uh, and interpreting and communicating those results accurately with the goal being to obtain the best patient outcomes we can. And that's a connection between the patient and the outcome that's much more easy to see in therapeutics. It's much harder to see in diagnostics, but it's important. The diagnostic utility of a multimodality approach in ACHD and in all of thoracic imaging is greater than the sum of the individual tests. And I tell my fellows it's important to focus on the patient's outcome and using all the tests that are needed. Not focus so much on conceiving of yourself as an echocardiographer or an MRI doctor or a CT doctor, but instead focus on becoming the best thoracic specialist that you can be. Cardiac and vascular MRI have been around for a long time. The AHA ACC guidelines have 65 specific recommendations for cardiac MRI with 31 class 1 recommendations and 23 class 2A recommendations. And congenital disease has a significant number of those recommendations. Patient-centered cardiac MRI refers specifically to an attempt at obtaining the shortest scan times possible for patient comfort and focusing our exams to acquire the information that only MRI can give us when other questions have been adequately addressed by echo, for example. It also means no IV, no contrast, and certainly no radiation if we can answer the questions without IV or contrast. Especially important with a lifetime of repeat assessments ahead in our ACHD population. It means a focus on high reproducibility, which is important for surgical decision making in RV volumes, for example, in tetralogy flow in patients that have chronic pulmonic regurgitation, and in patients, for example, in my own office setting who have chronic aortopathies. It also means doctor-to-doctor -doctor discussion of testing alternatives before the modalities are picked whenever possible to improve testing efficiency and costs, and also after the tests are done for complex patient management. That's best done in 2020 using cloud imaging sharing tools which can be done from any browser with smartphones and iPads in real-time collaboration. In our practice IHS of level 3 cardiothoracic imagers, we've been collaborating for cardiac MRI and cardiac CT across the United States to improve tertiary diagnoses around the country. Uh, we've been doing this about five years and have learned a lot about how to instantaneously collaborate to make tertiary diagnoses even in the acute setting and in the ED setting using modern tools. And that includes collaboration between cardiothoracic radiologists, cardiologists, pediatric cardiologists, interventionalists, non-interventionalists, and doctors all over the United States, wherever their expertise is located in physical space using internet-based tools, including cardiac CT, electrocardiography, echocardiography, MRI, we connected ourselves using a smartphone app that's designed to text us, to put one of us on call for each other so that we can 
offer our expertise anywhere in the United States. I think that it's underappreciated how important cardiac MRI is and the ability to evaluate MRIs now and read and report from any browser, from any computer that has Wi-Fi and internet access. And that's changed the way we think about cardiac MRI and, and where we can offer it. Um, it's changed the way we think about cardiac CT when this can be instantaneously uh, reported and images can move in cardiology across the internet and across states amongst tertiary imagers with expertise. Why do adult physicians have a role? Well, because there's too few congenital cardiologists, nearly 10 times more board certified adult than pediatric cardiologists, far too few to meet the need. And the first big wave of childhood congenital successes have now entered adulthood. And this has occurred um, over the, the last 20, 30 years, and we now see hospitalizations are up f in adult congenital heart disease, and we see that complex congenital heart disease has shifted the population to adult survivors. There are now more adults with congenital heart disease than there are children with congenital heart disease. At the same time, our ACHD patients are aging into adulthood. The doctors that take care of them in non-invasive cardiology are also aging. This data from the American College of Cardiology shows us that almost 31% of non-invasive cardiologists are 61 years of age or older. This is from 2018. So over the next three to five years, we're expecting a real shortage in non-invasive cardiology, and that has forced us to organize for the sake of our patients to be able to provide tertiary diagnoses instantly across the internet. Key points for cardiac MRI and adult congenital heart disease are baseline cardiac MRI is recommended for many patients that transition from pediatric to ACHD programs. Cardiac MRI is the gold standard for ventricular volumes, ejection fraction, and assessment of extracardiac thoracic anatomy. And that's because vascular structures are often poorly seen in adult echo. CMR frequency depends on the underlying defect and clinical status, and it's recommended with clinical deterioration, non-diagnostic echo, and prior to surgical or transcatheter intervention. CMR and ACHD should be supervised and reported by trained ACHD specialists. And the interval between scans depends on the findings at the first CMR study. Intervals of three or more Years are appropriate in most cases, but earlier restudies warranted with progression of symptoms. No photon is the best photon. No contrast is the best contrast. It's a mantra we repeat at our children's hospital. In the setting, MRI is a real complement to echo. MRI cine is multiplanar. The 3D non-contrast uses of MRI have become much more robust over the last 10 or 15 years. An MRI valve quantitation has become something we can really rely on, particularly when it comes to regurgitant jets. We all know the advantage of MRI, excellent tissue contrast, spatial and temporal resolution with no beta blockers required like cardiac CT. And our multiplanar cine stacks are the workhorse at looking at patients with poor acoustic windows. Ability to add stress perfusion for ischemia is, occasionally becomes important in ACHD. And contrast enhanced magnetic resonance and angiography of the systemic thoracic veins is an important addition to the non-contrast ability to see the great vessels. Delayed contrast enhancement has a emerging role in ACHD. In the adult in, with acquired heart disease, we have good data to show us the importance of finding infarcts like this subendocardial monocardial infarction that was not evident on a PET FDG study. However, in ACHD, it's sometimes not clear what the importance is of finding a infarct after Fontan, for example, of this patient, or in patients with fibroelastosis along the subendocardium after congenital aortic valve stenosis. We know their risks for ventricular arrhythmias are probably increased, but we don't have the long-term data uh, in ACHD MRI like we do in acquired heart disease MRI. In 2020, the cardiac MRI scanners have gotten 
um, much more sophisticated than they were 10 years ago. And the bore size is also enlarged a bit, and that allows us to provide uh, a more comfortable exam. You can do great cardiac MRI with a 71 centimeter bore as opposed to the prior generation of 60 centimeter bore cardiac MRIs. The console has also always been daunting. When we sit at the computer to do cardiac MRI, it's quite sophisticated and um, almost intimidating. However, manufacturers have come up with interesting techniques to walk a technologist through the cardiac MRI exam, and that's made it easier to train a MRI technologist to do good cardiac and good congenital cardiac. A localizer that the computer displays over the initial views finds the basic views and then can translate those into 15 simultaneous views that allow us to immediately get good cardiac MRI in multiple planes. And that shortens the exam time and uh, improves the speed of uh, developing a program. The Society of Cardiac MRI has now put out expert consensus protocols on congenital heart disease. Um, so I tell docs who are starting off cardiac MRI programs that they don't have to reinvent the wheel and can start with the protocols that have been published by the SCMR. The European Society of Cardiology has put out multimodality imaging doc documents <clears throat> as recently as two years ago and pointed out the benefits and the imaging goals, in particular patient subsets. Some of them are well known to us in the ACHD community, like the imaging goals and repair tetralogy of Fallot, for example. We look for the right ventricular volumes, we look for the right ventricular ejection fraction, we quantify the pulmonic regurgitant fraction, we characterize the PA and flow through the PAs, as well as looking at aortic root and ascending aorta size, looking for aorta to PA collaterals, and using 3D SSFP, the proximal course and origin of the coronary arteries, particularly important before pulmonic valve surgical replacements. In transposition of the great arteries after atrial switch, the importance of the systemic RV volume and RV ejection fraction is well known. Systemic and pulmonary venous pathways uh, are well imaged using cardiac MRI when we look for baffle leaks or obstructions, as well as looking for LVOT obstruction and the coronary arteries as well. Here's a patient who we're performing a contrast enhanced magnetic resonance angiogram. And as we scroll from the front to the back using coronal images, we see the azagous vein here filled robustly with contrast on the first injection next to the descending thoracic aorta. And that's our first clue that we should suspect systemic thoracic baffle obstruction rotating the, co the planes into a slight LAO position to, to put the SVC baffle on um, plane. We can see here the SVC baffle is 100% occluded. By scrolling in on a maximum intensity projection, uh, total occlusion is then verified um, by uh, MRI with the bird speaking of this stenosis here and occlusion here. And this patient was opened percutaneously uh, prior to a pacemaker insertion in that superior baffle limb. In transposition of the great arteries after arterial switch, once again, the course of the coronary arteries, their origin uh, become important. And we can also do myocardial stress perfusion if needed. Residual intracardiac shunts, the branch PAs as they splay over that aorta and evaluation of any neoaortic root dilatation and regurgitation are also important in long-term follow-up. I like to do this as much as possible using whole heart 3D SSFP imaging. It's a technique that I think is, is underutilized in most tertiary centers. It involves putting the patient in the magnet with no IV and the technologist adds a pencil beam navigator over the diaphragm, watching the diaphragm moving up and down, and then gates to respiration and gates the acquisition simultaneously to the ECG. And what's produced is an outstanding picture of the entire thorax that requires 
no contrast, no IV, and no radiation. And the coronaries can be well visualized. All the great vessels are well visualized and um, are bright, including all the right-sided structures and the left-sided structures and the coronaries. Similar to cardiac CT, on the bottom, the, the whole heart 3D SSFP MRI on the top are almost indistinguishable. And it's a technique that I think um, is, is, uh, is needed in many hospitals. This technique has been around for over 10 years, but I think a lot of hospitals haven't pushed their imaging departments to refine it for multiple uses. I'd like to show you how easy it can be to evaluate the thorax using this technique. Here on a workstation, I've loaded a 3D non-contrast study. By double-clicking, we can look at the three-dimensional MRI and get uh, a bird's eye view with a large field of view over the entire thorax. By switching our viewing algorithm to maximum intensity projections, we can see in this patient with detransposition quite a bit of neoaortic root dilatation. We can see the origins of the coronaries. Here is the RCA in the right atrioventricular groove with a normal origin. Here is the left coronary artery coursing into the triangle of Brock and Mouché, giving rise to the LAD, the diagonals, and the circumflex as it courses underneath the left atrial appendage. At the same time, we can see the pulmonary arteries anteriorly as they splay across the aorta, the pulmonary veins, the inferior vena cava are all well visualized with no need for contrast and provides us with an excellent view of the entire thorax. Importantly, we can get accurate measurements of aortic structures, for example, with measurements that are reproducible year after year and accurate to one millimeter and orthogonal to flow. In single ventricle patients, the Vontan pathway patency is an important concern, as well as patency at the glen anastomosis. We can easily see the flow through the pulmonary arteries without any contrast. The ventricular volumes are reproducible, as is the single ventricle ejection fraction, and AV valve regurgitation can be quantitated. Aorto to pulmonary and systemic to pulmonary venous collaterals can be seen using contrast-enhanced MRI as well. We usually begin on the CINE images by looking for non-laminar flow, which usually implies physical obstruction. In MRI, if there's any metallic elements that can fool us and cause a metallic artifact. Problems at the Glen anastomosis of the Fontan obstruction. We can assess ventricular dysfunction and valvular regurgitation and importantly look for sources of ongoing cyanosis such as collaterals or uh, fenestration. Occasionally I've rounded on single ventricle patients with suspicion of pulmonary embolism. Here's an adult woman post Fontan with a history of tricuspid atresia who was admitted with atypical chest pain and had a CT scan suggesting this clot burden in the right pulmonary artery. It's important to recognize that the Glen, which is injected with contrast from the right arm, and the Fontan, which may not have been injected from the right leg, can cause streaming of non-contrasted blood into the lung, and that can very much interfere with an accurate diagnosis of pulmonary embolism in these patients who we know are prone to form thrombi in the Fontan pathway here. So what do you do? This is where cardiac MRI excels. By using the techniques of non-contrast MRI, I took the patient down and did a simultaneous MRI with no contrast and could see the Fontan pathway widely patent with no thrombi in it, the glen attached to the pulmonary arteries without any uh, stenoses, and importantly, no evidence of any pulmonary emboli in any of the pulmonary arterial vascular arborization was able to turn off her heparin. And this is done with no IV contrast, 
no radiation, and uh, is reproducible. Sometimes no contrast is the best contrast. Valvular heart disease, echo is of course first line, but MRI excels with regurgitant lesions by phase contrast velocity mapping. We can get excellent biventricular volumes and ejection fractions. It's been recently shown that the regurgitant fraction by MRI is one of the best predictors long term of a composite endpoint of heart failure, hospitalization, and death after BNP levels. The main advantage of CMR-based flow is an interrogation of any thoracic vessel in any plane in patients with RV to pulmonary artery conduits, for example, which are often too anterior to be assessed with echo. Volumes and flow analysis allow non-invasive measurements of intracardiac and extracardiac shunts, of course, and allow us to avoid unnecessary invasive procedures. One excellent use of cardiac MRI and ACHD is in pregnancy with high-risk aortopathy. Aortopathy in the pregnant woman, as we all know, carries substantial cardiovascular risks with WHO pregnancy risk class three to four because of the hemodynamic changes and hormonally driven structural effects on vascular and connective tissue. Once again, the 3D SSFP whole heart sequence helps us a great deal. Without contrast, without an IV, and without any radiation, we can obtain excellent views of the entire thoracic and abdominal aorta in about 15 to 20 minutes and use this to follow the entire thoracic aorta as needed in patients that are high risk with aortopathies. One of the important aspects of this is the ability to reproducibly measure the aorta carefully and with one millimeter accuracy. In my own clinic for the aorta, our first task is to obtain high quality MRI or CT of the thoracic aorta so we can measure accurately the aorta at multiple points along the vessel perpendicular to flow and index those to body surface area and index those to patient's height to refine the risk. Simultaneously looking for high risk markers such as sonotubular ridge effacement and AI. Without careful three-dimensional imaging, it's very difficult to follow these patients and accurately calculate an expansion rate of a few millimeters. Those few millimeters are sometimes our only clue before aortic catastrophe. Discrepancies in measurement of the thoracic aorta have been well identified, and the sources of imaging discrepancies include measurement in systole or diastole, measurement of the lumen only, or the lumen plus the aortic wall, and probably most importantly, measurement oblique to the curvature of the aorta rather than measuring the aorta accurately perpendicular to flow. To validate our aortic measurements, we can ask our surgeons to put calipers on the thoracic aorta prior to aortic surgery so that within our institutions we can obtain excellent intermodality correlation. How often to do the echo during pregnancy to follow these patients and the MRI is an unknown. It's reasonable to do an echo every three months in low-risk women with a mildly dilated aorta, probably monthly echo with a severely dilated aorta or those at high risk for dissection, and that should include follow-up imaging after delivery. Stanford type A dissections are, of course, surgical emergencies that necessitate cardiothoracic surgery to repair the dissection and rapidly deliver the fetus. And conservative medical management with strict blood pressure control is recommended for stable type B dissections and sometimes TVAR in addition to blood pressure control. Echo of the thoracic aorta sometimes drives you nuts. Suprasternal notch views can suggest coarctations that don't exist in adults with poor echo windows. And the innominate vein commonly causes an artifact that can mimic a dissection. If dissection does occur,
It is most frequently during the third trimester of pregnancy or postpartum. Hence the importance of following patients in the postpartum period carefully. Any woman with Marfan's who presents with chest or intrascapular pain during pregnancy should have urgent imaging of the entire aorta and that can be by ECG gated CT or non-contrast MRI. Here's a patient with back pain with a history of aortopathy who suffered a type B dissection. We imaged her by MRI with no IV, with no radiation and no contrast, and can see the type B dissection with compression of an anterior true lumen. This was leading to a creatinine elevation of 2.5, a lactate of 20 from type B malperfusion to the gut related to anterior compression of the true lumen by the false lumen. It's important to remember that the IRAD registry, the International Registry of Aortic Dissection, has shown us that two imaging studies in the first 24 hours are necessary in almost 70% of patients. So we should never hesitate to do serial imaging if the diagnosis of an acute aortic syndrome is equivocal. The clinical features and outcomes of pregnancy-related acute aortic dissection were just published in October in this excellent article in JAMA Cardiology. Importantly, Aortic diameters before acute aortic dissection in patients with syndromic aortopathies were not that high before aortic dissection, with the Marfan's patients suffering dissections at 41, 45, and 47 millimeters, and Louis Dietz patients suffering even with normal diameters. Importantly, after those with Marfan's diagnosis, the next largest group were patients who had no aortopathy diagnosis. Which aortopathy is associated with this finding in the mouth? The answer is C, Louis Dietz syndrome. Our knowledge of the genes that are associated with thoracic aortic aneurysm and dissection has been increasing over the last 10 years with new genes coming out Every few years, we are now up to 39 different genes that are associated with aortopathies. One of the most recent ones is the Robo4 gene associated with bicuspid aortic valve and thoracic aortic aneurysms. With specific gene mutations or susceptibility variants, we may soon tailor surgical recommendations for each patient. For example, the Robo4 gene patients would get standard recommendations for surgery at thresholds between 5 and 5.5 with smooth muscle cell contractile unit gene patients like ACTA2 getting surgery at thresholds closer to the Louis Dietz threshold. Recently, the neglected dimension of the ascending aorta length and risk of aortic adverse events was published in 2019 and points out that the distance from the aortic annulus to the takeoff of the innominate artery as an important risk factor for rupture, dissection, and death, especially when indexed to body height in meters similar to the diameter of the aorta. Once the ascending aorta length reaches approximately 11.5, the probability of acute aortic syndromes takes off, and this warrants important consideration in deciding when to prophylactically repair a patient with a dilated aorta and an underlying intrinsic aortopathy. In conclusion, the diagnostic utility of a multimodality approach is greater than the sum of the individual tests. We should focus on the patient outcome and not the individual modalities. MRI, however, is an important complement to echo and ACHD. Remember the mantra, no photon is the best photon, no contrast is the best contrast. Aortopathy in pregnancy can be evaluated safely without any contrast, particularly using 3D SSFP techniques and CINE SSFP techniques. No gadolinium should be given to pregnant women due to fetal risks. And in patient-centered MRI, we should remember to try to focus the exams in cardiac MRI, use doctor-to-doctor -doctor discussion of testing alternatives and complex patient management, and that involves cloud image sharing from any browser for real-time collaboration, especially in tertiary diagnoses. I'd like to thank Deborah Hart and Lung 
for asking me to speak. Thank you very much.